Hello, I'm Dr. Dennis Bielfeldt of the Christ School of Theology. We're dealing today with Kant, and we've worked up to the so-called peer concepts of the understanding. And these are principles governing uh, the empirical concepts. If you remember, the empirical concepts were rules uh, that had to do with the uh, uh, synthesis of the manifold of uh, sense intuition, right? So it, they were rules by which the manifold of sense is united. Now the uh, principles here are rules governing rules. Okay? Substance and causality are types of relations, as we talked about last time. And they are pure concepts that govern the organization of the empirical concepts. A substance is thus the rule by which empirical objects perdure through time. Very interesting part of the critique. Um, it's always been fairly plausible, uh, to me anyway. Causality is the rule by which uh, objects connect with each other. Hmm? Substance and causality together, according to Kant, allow for the universality of, and the necessity of science and thus save Newton from the clutches of Hume. See? So, yay Newton. Now, what Kant argues then is that these rules, substance and causality, are rules that relate manifolds of sense intuition. So they are rules that deal with the empirical order. They are rules upon rules which deal with the intuitions that are filtered through the grid of uh, space and time from the noumenal things in themselves. So, substance and causality. Now this is an important point for any theologian to grasp. On Kantian grounds, substance and causality are terms that only have their proper application in the empirical order. Okay? When the pure concepts of understanding, that's all of them, but we're talking about substance and causality here, are applied outside the realm of their proper application, which is in the empirical uh, Bereich realm, there is a transcendental illusion or a transcendental subruption. A transcendental illusion arises when we use concepts, pure concepts of the understanding, properly applicable only to uh, empirical uh, order, the empirical order, when we use those things metaphysically beyond the bounds of possible experience. Grenzen der mögliche uh, Erfahrung. Now, while it seems, according to Kant, like we can metaphysically reason to the necessity of a first cause from the universe, we are bewitched when we do so, because that reasoning makes use of the category of causality, which is only the rule by which uh, objects in the empirical order are connected to each other. When we try to apply those things outside the empirical order, we're in real trouble. And this is the trouble that Leibniz got himself into, the trouble that Spinoza got himself into, the trouble that Wolf got himself into, and this is what uh, Hume woke Kant to, because Kant was getting into this trouble for a while as for well, right? Kant was awakened from his dogmatic slumbers by David Hume. So, here now in the transcendental dialectic, Kant is going to show what happens to reason when we take these categories outside their proper bounds. And in a very important section called the Antinomies of Pure Reason, he shows that when you take these categories of substance and causality outside their proper bounds, 
you can prove uh, to the necessity of a first cause for the universe, and you can prove to the non-necessity of a first cause of the universe. You can prove uh, the immortality of the soul, or you can prove that the soul is not immortal. You can prove that the cosmos has a unity, or you can prove that it has no unity, right? And as part of all of this, Kant argues that the uh, traditional arguments for the existence of God, and he talks about three here, the ontological argument, the physical the teleological argument, uh, which is the teleological argument, and the cosmological argument, all three of these arguments fail because all make use of the notion of the substance, God is a substance, causally related to other things. And this happens outside the bounds of possible experience. So reason goes on a holiday, Fernuft goes on a holiday, and it thinks it can reason things, but actually it's just bewitching itself. It's not going anywhere. It's like a wheel idly turning, to use Wittgenstein's trenchant phrase. So, uh, the arguments for the existence of God finally fail. Now, here is the point. Traditional metaphysics, that realm of the a priori synthetic that is most important to human being, and Kant goes on and on and on and about how metaphysics is just natural to human beings. It's part of our most noble character. The problem is it always gets into mischief. While Kant believes that human beings are naturally metaphysical, metaphysical knowledge of the kind that they want to have is impossible. This is a bummer. While Kant claims that God, immortality, and freedom are the great ideas of humankind, metaphysical knowledge of them is impossible. This is a bummer. Reason, Fernunft, making use of these noble concepts of cause and, and uh, substance, cannot give metaphysical truth. All that reason can do is it can regulate the way we think things, but it does not tell us how things are. We have many reasons why it's, it's useful for us, if you will, uh, to think of the unity of the world, uh, to think of the unity of an earth essence, uh, primal essence uh, from which other things come. But that doesn't mean there is any such thing, Kant argues. Very redundant, really. <laughs> it's part of the critique. Uh, okay. So, the results of the first critique. Kant says that he has taken away reasons, the claim of reason, uh, to knowledge of metaphysical truth, and so that any of this area of God must finally be the province of faith. And while he says that, he has very little interest in following and talking about faith at that point. The results of the first critique, all empirical objects are deterministically related by cause and effect relationships. But this is in the phenomenal order. The noumenal order which is not necessarily deterministic, cannot be accessed. All objects in the phenomenal order are related by causality and uh, so make use of the notion of substance and deterministic laws govern them. What's actually in the noumenal order outside of our way of apprehending things, we don't know what that is. That's the result of the first critique. So, this is extremely, uh, shall we say, theology is very precarious at this point because, of course, theologians for a very long time had talked about arguments for the existence of God. Uh, if you just go back and read the medieval uh, theologians, you see how much they talked about it, and, of course, the, the medieval or the late, uh, or the early modern philosophers and their metaphysics uh, kept doing the same thing. Kant kind of puts an end to all this and said, halt, you can go no further. I'm Dr. Dennis Bielfeld of the Christ School of Theology, and I'll be right back with you. Thank you. <laughs>